Hi, I'm Rob Ward, the uh, chief of MSK at uh, Tufts Medical Center in Boston, and I have the distinct pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Dr. Chuck Cassidy, professor and chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Tufts Medical Center. Dr. Cassidy uh, went to uh, Harvard for undergrad, uh, Northwestern for medical school, and completed his orthopedics residency and hand fellowship at Tufts Medical Center. And with that, I hand over the talk to Dr. Cassidy. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, Rob, and uh, thanks, Hillary, and everyone for uh, allowing me to spend an hour with you. And uh, hopefully we'll have some time for some dialogue. So uh, what I thought I would do is just uh, show a couple a, a couple of cases uh, with some clinical correlates um, uh, to uh, stimulate some discussion. So, and, uh-oh, here, okay. So, uh, as you know, dynamic problems may not be captured well by MR. Um, and so we'll talk about two elbow and two wrist problems, uh, plica and posterior lateral rotatory instability. Um, and in the wrist, ECU instability and uh, TFCC DRUJ instability. So uh, this image is an image of uh, uh, what was described as normal anatomy uh, on the left-hand side, a, uh, a plica of the elbow, uh, quasi abnormal on the right-hand image, uh, but as considered a normal variant. Um, this is a patient uh, with a snapping elbow and hopefully you'll be able to see this right there. It's somewhat subtle, but you can see it jumping back and forth. Um, I'll play it one more time. And sometimes these are painful, sometimes they're not. Maybe associated with lateral epicondylitis. Um, and this is what's been called synovial fringe syndrome, uh, which is synovitis along the, uh, the plica, the proximal edge of the annular ligament. Um, and this is after cleaning it up. And you can see uh, here uh, some thinning of the uh, cartilage at the lateral margin of the capitellum from the, the plica. Um, the plica does something different than what I actually thought it did. I thought it got incarcerated in the radial capitellar joint with uh, elbow flexion, but that's not the case. So here's a plica. So we're looking at the capitellum above, radial head below. Uh, and as you extend the elbow, it pops into the joint. So it, with elbow extension, it snaps into the joint. So it's not with flexion, it gets incarcerated, it's with extension. And so the position in which the elbow is held uh, during the MR may influence what you see. Uh, and so here's, uh, here's an image. So this would be the annular ligament with the plica extension, if you wanna call it that in a uh, fairly neutral position. And with the elbow extended, it drapes over the radial head into the radial capitellar joint. And with elbow flexion, it slides down the slope of the neck of the radial head and gets out of the way. And so it can be missed uh, during arthroscopy if, uh, if the elbow is just maintained at, at 90 degrees. Uh, here's a patient I treated recently uh, who has a plica and you could see uh, lots of wear on the lateral edge of the capitellum and also a groove in the uh, ra radial ulnar portion of the radial head from the plica. So this is following debridement right there. Um, and so uh, these uh, structures are, are pretty uh, firm and not easy to, uh, to excise with a shaver. So this is an arthroscopic scissor to, uh, to bite it, to get, catch an edge. And this is after it's been completed. Uh, so that window is sort of what you would do for tennis elbow procedure as well. You can see the uh, underlying uh, muscle. Um, the next is a posterior lateral rotatory instability. It's one of my favorite topics. Um, the question is, is this elbow unstable? I would say probably, uh, but again, uh, we have to order a physical examination on these patients. How about these? Are these elbows unstable on the left? Uh, not so helpful. Uh, on the right, a little more helpful, I would say. Uh, both of these elbows uh, turned out to be unstable. 
So posterior lateral rotatory instability is uh, caused by deficiency of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, uh, which is really more like a sheet uh, than a, a, a ligament. When you uh, look at it in real life, it's like a thickening of the capsule. Um, and it uh, drapes over the posterior lateral edge of the radial head like a sling that helps to support uh, the elbow on the lateral side. And that's commonly evulsed with uh, terrible triad injuries. And that's an example on the right. You can see the radial head replacement because the radial head was not reparable, but a bald epicondyle uh, from avulsion of the lateral collateral ligament that includes the lateral ulnar collateral ligament right there. Um, and so it's it's, what it is is it's, it's external rotation or hypersupination uh, with this injury. And so it pivots around the medial collateral ligament. So the olecranon or proximal ulna is depicted in the trapezoid in blue and the radial head in orange and the red is the sling of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. And with posterior lateral rotatory instability, it, it drops out, the radial head drops out and then uh, swings underneath the capitellum. There are varying degrees of instability. It's not all or none. So patients may have mild instability that really presents as pain rather than uh, me mechanical symptoms. So uh, I had mentioned both of these were unstable. Uh, this was uh, an interesting patient. He is uh, 48. He had a, pro uh, uh, I'm sorry, a distal humeral fracture at age five. Uh, and you could see that he's got cubitus varus on the left. Uh, he was doing well until he had a minor injury and then his elbow became unstable. Uh, he underwent an allograft reconstruction nine months earlier, uh, and he told me that uh, they put a cast on postoperatively. He could feel it dislocating in the cast. So um, a tardy posterior lateral instability is a sequelae of, uh, a sequela of uh, cubitus virus from childhood, interestingly. Uh, and these are his x-rays you can see. Uh, the varus alignment. He's got some ar early arthritis, um, as you see there. And you can see on the lateral, kind of interesting, the space between his uh, radial head and his capitellum is, is increased. It's tough to get a good lateral on these patients because they're in so much varus. This, you know, the, the way the tech normally would position the elbow is not going to give you a good lateral. Um, and this is uh, pretty dramatic. So these are axial images, and you can see um, the capacious posterior lateral uh, capsule and the radial head uh, dropped in, in the back. So it's uh, been termed a sag sign. And, and the, the, you can see the, uh, the uh, olecranon is off to the side a little bit. And the elbow, when this uh, MR was taken was interesting, it was dislocated. You can see the sagittal images. And uh, so there were really two reasons I think for failure, one was the fact that there was uh, such underlying cubitus uh, varus, but also that the, the ligament reconstruction was not isometric. So you could see how distal and posterior was relatively speaking. So if it's, uh, if it's tightened in that position, as soon as the elbow is flexed, it, it stretches out. Um, so he, here's a coronal uh, CT image of how much uh, varus he's in. And so we did a combined uh, lateral ligament reconstruction and an osteotomy. Um, uh, but beforehand, I got a CT and uh, Rob was so helpful with this one. So I wanted to get it in the dislocated position and the reduced position because I was a little worried because he had some bony changes that um, maybe he maybe he felt more comfortable with it out than with it in. You can see how it's, it's rotated around, translated. Uh, but it reduced nicely uh, on the left-hand side. Um, and so here are some uh, intraoperative stress images. So most patients with posterior lateral rotatory instability do not have true varus instability, uh, but this guy did. So here's uh, his left elbow. That's varus stress. You can see how unstable it is. Uh, usually elbows are rock solid in extension. I'll play that one more time. And uh, this is a combination of uh, kind of a posterior drawer pivot shift analogous to a Lachman and a pivot shift in a knee. So you can see the scar from his prior procedure and uh, his elbow rotates out, that's his radial head. 
you can see. So it's not a radial head dislocation, it's the, the radius and ulnar are moving together. Um, and you can see it rotate out. That's the reduced position, dislocated position. And that's the dimple sign you can see uh, in the back uh, here where the, uh, the radial head is uh, displaced posteriorly. Uh, this is an intraoperative photo. You can see he's got some early arthritic changes. You can see the old ligament uh, um, stump from his uh, ligament that was had ruptured. Um, and treating these, uh, it's important to find the isometric point. So the, there really is an isometric point in the elbow. It's, uh, it, it's like a hinge. Uh, and so one way of doing it is to make a bone tunnel in the ulna at the Christo supinatoris and pass a stitch and then just use that and flex and extend the elbow with it reduced to, to find the isometric point. Um, and so this is, uh, this is his reconstruction. You could see uh, he's back in valgus. Um, and I also used what's called an, uh, an internal uh, joint stabilizer, IJS, uh, which is, uh, it's essentially a clamp with a, uh, a smooth pin that's placed in the axis of the elbow um, that will allow motion, uh, but keep it stable. So we used to protect elbows sometimes with external fixators and we do for really you know bad associated soft tissue injuries, but this is nice because it's under the skin. Uh, and if it's placed properly, it doesn't get loose. And so you can be uh, a little more uh, liberal with the rehab afterwards. And so uh, that's in pre-op and post-op. He's very happy. He doesn't want to have the thing taken out, interestingly. Um, so those are the two elbow cases. And now we'll talk about a couple of, uh, a couple of wrist cases. Um, so, uh, and Rob did not read either of the MR reports that I am going to uh, describe. Uh, but what's, something is wrong with this statement. Irregularity of the ulnar attachment of the TFC consistent with ulnar sided TFC tear, volar and dorsal radial ulnar ligaments are intact. No contrast within the distal radial ulnar. Um, so the, the topic of this segment is really undersurface TFC tears or peripheral, peripheral TFC tears that are destabilizing tears. So um, we'll go through a little bit of anatomy after a couple of more images. So is this Distal radial joint unstable, no. Uh, that is a central TFC tear, which is not a destabilizing tear. What about these? Um, I would speculate that the one on the left is unstable. The one on the right, it could maybe be unstable. It's kind of a spectrum of pathology. Is this one unstable? There are a few fibers heading in the right direction, but doesn't, it doesn't look, certainly doesn't look normal. Um, the TFCC, as you know, is uh, a, a complex structure um, that includes the uh, articular disc, which is the thing that tears for, uh, in a T, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in a central tear. Um, and uh, that's surrounded by the volar and dorsal radial ulnar ligaments. Um, and then along the volar rim uh, come off the ulnar lunate and ulnar triquetral ligaments. Um, and then we have the, uh, the ECU uh, su uh, subsheath so that the, that complex helps to stabilize the extensor carpi ulnaris and also contributes to distal radial ulnar joint stability. Um, and these are some fantastic uh, images courtesy mm -hmm. of uh, my friend Emmett Gupta. Uh, from Louisville. Uh, and so these are dis disarticulated uh, images and you can see the radius, the AD is the articular disc, uh, the margins are the volar and dorsal uh, radial ulnar ligaments, PR is the pre-styloid recess. Uh, and that would be a central tear right there. So, and that, that area uh, is like a cushion. Uh, it helps to distribute load that, that can be excised without destabilizing the distal radial ulnar joint. The margins, however, uh, cannot be compromised. So those are the volar and dorsal radial ulnar ligaments. Um, and this is just a beautiful image of, um, of the fact that, it, it, uh, demonstrating the fact that 
the ligamentous structures are complex. So the proximal fibers, as you see here, otherwise known as the ligamentum subcruentum, uh, attach um, in a more central location on the ulnar head and the distal radial ulnar ligaments attach to the styloid. So this is a dorsal view, beautiful. And that proximal one, that's the one that causes the instability really. So on, on an undersurface tear, that is detached. Um, and so this, this study shows the topographical uh, anatomy of the, of the attachment. And you can see that the deep limb attaches right into the center. So if you were to draw, extend that arc into a circle, that is really the center of the circle where you see the red uh, or the image on the right, that green dot. So you can see that the deep fibers are really uh, pretty isometric. The, the ones that are depicted in blue are the, uh, the distal fibers that uh, attach to the, the inside of the st styloid. Um, so here is a, a, a volar view uh, and you can see the proximal radial ulnar ligament, the PRUL. It's almost confluent with the short radial lunate ligament. Um, and then we have the um, ulno uh, lunate and ulnar triquetral ligaments sort of blending in with the distal fibers of the volar uh, radial ulnar ligament and attaching to uh, the styloid itself. And then the, the, the ulnar limb of the volar arcuate complex has a, an origin where you could see, if you want to call it an origin, an attachment uh, at the base. And then that's the thing depicted with the asterisk. Uh, but again, the proximal fibers are the most important. Those are the distal fibers. And that's the ulno uh, carpal sleeve right there. Um, these images are um, uh, from Tom Fisher, uh, who's from Indiana, great guy, and um, uh, was gracious to share these with me. So this is an axial view, uh, and the deep fibers or proximal fibers are depicted in blue, and the green fibers are the distal fibers that are uh, depicted in uh, green right there. Um, and the whole concept of what gets taught and what is loose with pronation and supination was always confusing to me. And these images, I think, really help to clarify it. So uh, in pronation, the ulna wants to go dorsal. The radius wants to go volar. So that's why your ulnar head is more prominent in pronation. Um, the deep or proximal fibers on the volar side are tight in pronation. And the distal superficial fibers are tight in pronation. So when I was a resident, uh, there were conflicting studies that said the opposite. It was funny. One study said that the volar limb gets, gets tight in pronation. And the other study said that the dorsal limb gets tight in pronation. And it turned out they were, they were actually studying different elements of the radial ulnar ligaments. So the volar, the blue, is tight in pronation. Um, and so uh, I like this image of this guy. Uh, so pronation like that with the weight, your radius wants to fall relative to your ulna. And what's holding it is your volar uh, radial ulnar ligament, the portion that's proximal or deep. Okay, uh, in contrast, in supination, the radius wants to move dorsal. Um, and what's preventing that is the uh, dorsal uh, pro proximal radial ulnar fibers right there. The deep blue is tight. That's restricting uh, the translation uh, dorsally. And then the superficial uh, volar fibers are tight in supination. So when we do reconstructions, we uh, really uh, focus on the blue and not the green. Okay, so this is supination. So the ulna is the kind of the reference, right? That's the rigid structure. And then the radius wants to fall volar. And the, uh, the dorsal fibers that you see there, the proximal dorsal fibers are restricting uh, the radius from translating uh, more dorsally. All right, so again, that's, uh, we're talking about the radio ulnar joint. Uh, and so, uh, uh, in close proximity and in fact attached is the ulnar carpal sleeve. So um, in patients who have radial ulnar instability, they may also have 
um, carpal supination, intercarpal supination. So here's an example of somebody who has some instability on the ulnar side of the wrist. And so the, we look at the sort of like the slope of the metacarpal heads relative to the forearm. And the carpus can supinate. So the ulnar carpal sleeve is like a sling that holds up the ulnar side of the wrist. And if that attenuates, like for example, with rheumatoid arthritis, you'll get um, carpal intercarpal supination or supination of the wrist relative to the forearm in addition to uh, the radial ulnar joint stretching out. So the ulnar head becomes more prominent. So it's a combination of uh, dorsal ulnar subluxation and uh, inter carpal supination that uh, is what you see uh, with advanced rheumatoid arthritis, like a caput ulna syndrome. Um, so uh, one test that we do is what's called the ulnar carpal shift. So you push up on the pisiform and down on the ulna. So here's that. So you can see how much rotation there is in the hand or wrist relative to the forearm in this patient. So it's said that there's about one degree, normally about one degree of intercarpal rotation for every three degrees of forearm rotation. Uh, sometimes patients can uh, demonstrate their instability themselves. And this uh, woman had had surgery uh, previously and you can see, she can show me what happens. Her uh, firing, it, it's unstable. You can see there, she can drive her ulna down or up. And you can see what laxity that there is uh, in her radial ulnar joint right there. Tends to be more stable in general in supination than in pronation. Um, so these are challenging ones uh, to evaluate by MR. I would say that we're talking about the B type. So this is the Palmer classification of acute tears. So the A is the central tear. It's probably the most common thing that, that that uh, we see. The B type is off of the owner side. A C type is also uh, is very rare and it's a split tear of the ulnar carpal sleeve. Um, and a D type is where it's off of the radius. Uh, and the D type is sometimes confused with a central tear. So uh, in order for it really to be truly a D type, it should um, involve the proximal uh, 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 dorsal and volar uh, radial ulnar ligaments. So that's kind of a, de that's a destabilizing tear too, um, as opposed to a, a central tear, which is not destabilizing. Um, so as I mentioned from the outset with this, is there is a spectrum of injury and instability um, with respect to these tears on the, on the ulnar side. Uh, so we'll go through a, a little video of a patient I operated on uh, fairly recently, you can see uh, in pronation, the ulna is pretty prominent uh, there. And he had a relatively minor uh, injury, but had uh, chronic uh, ulnar side of wrist pain. Um, so uh, this is his, his study. And that's the one that I mentioned, uh, said that there was a tear on the ulnar side, the ulnar side of TFC tear, but the volar and dorsal radial ulnar ligaments are intact which technically is not possible. So if it's torn, it's torn uh, and uh, you can't have it both ways. So here it is, it was read as a tear on the owner side, uh, but uh, not complete. So here are some representative images. He had had a, 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 a distal radius fracture as a kid and he had this little ulnar styloid non-union. So, but the main component, the most important one is the, is the ligamentum subcurrentum, which is underneath. It's not the tip of the styloid. So that part's inconsequential. So I'd be interested to hear what people have to say about this. Uh, and again, Rob Ward did not read this one. Um, and here is uh, an image, in, uh, an axial image. And you can see, uh, I know they can draw some lines, but to me, it, it looks a little bit uh, subluxated. Uh, so again, here we're talking about the proximal uh, radial ulnar ligaments, and that's uh, the repair technique essentially that uh, you see in that illustration uh, is what we're going to do. Um, so here's his uh, pre-op exam. You can see lots of translation uh, in pronation and in neutral, uh, and in supination, it was much more stable. 
here's his uh, some images of the coronal images. Uh, and once again, you see there the tear. Here's his uh, arthroscopy. So we're looking at the TFC. Uh, that's the articular disc, and that's about a three millimeter probe. And you can see the underside of that is, uh, is not firmly anchored. Uh, often there's some associated uh, uh, synovitis and sometimes some scarring. And this is after a little debridement, you can see how unstable it is. It's not totally, totally unstable. That's why it was uh, stable in supination. So now we're, that was in the distal radial joint under the dorsal radial ligament and, and then distal to it. And so we placed some, after we're roughening up the, the um, attachment point for the curette, we passed some stitches, it's arthroscopically assisted. So from the distal window, which is called the 6R uh, window, it's an arthroscopic portal. Uh, we pass stitches and then uh, retrieve them under the triangular fibrocartilage, which is uh, sometimes a technical challenge to, to find them through a small incision, but uh, I think the rehab is a little bit easier for the patients if you do it that way. So here's a curette scraping out take some Keith needles, which we drill through from that spot, exactly where the attachment point is like that. Um, and then you'll see we uh, pass the sutures. So we're under the TFC through the ulna and then have to make a separate incision uh, on the volar, volar ulnar side, as you see there, uh, retrieve the stitches, hopefully not incarcerate the dorsal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve. like that. And then um, this is just showing uh, traction on the sutures. Uh, and you can see how uh, just pulling them down retensions the, the uh, ligament. So here it is after it's been repaired. Uh, and then we immobilize the patients in about 45 degrees of supination uh, for a month. So they are in a long arm cast for a month and then a short arm cast for a month. Um, it's a slow rehab. That's in, in contradistinction to a central TFC tear, which you just debrid and you don't need to immobilize those patients. Um, so, okay. Um, and so here it, it was after we finished, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the repair. And then, uh, and then finally, ECU instability. Uh, this to me is a really, it's a challenging one uh, in terms of uh, diagnostic dilemmas. Um, and also interpreting uh, imaging. It may be subtle. Um, so uh, the retinaculum uh, that you see that, uh, that houses the, the six extensor compartments also is draped over the ECU, which is the sixth compartment. Uh, but deep to that, there's a subsheath that uh, really is what stabilizes the ECU within the groove. Um, and as you know, uh, the groove may be shallow or, or deep. Um, and I, I like this image because it, it looks so clean that, you know, the, the, the ECU tendon is so happy sitting housed in this, in this little wall with a nice cover over it, but that's not, re that's not reality. Um, and uh, this is a study uh, that looked at, uh, I would call it translation of the ECU with forearm rotation and the position of the ECU when the image was taken. Um, and so, so to use the watershed line in, uh, in terms of a reference to uh, describe the degree of, uh, of displacement or subluxation. Uh, but in reality, you know, the, the, the ECU uh, is fixed to the ulnar uh, aspect of the hand at the base of the fifth metacarpal um, and so in pronation, it's uh, an ulnar deviator, and in supination, it is uh, a wrist extensor, right? And so it's going, it's rotating from the ulnar side uh, to the dorsal side because your ulna is not moving. So there's a fair amount of translation that's occurring uh, in, the, in the ECU with forearm rotation uh, normally. Um, and this was uh, uh, a study that showed, this is a normal, uh, subject where you can see you, it, the ECU is not even, it doesn't even look at, like it's in the groove. Uh, and this patient was asymptomatic there in uh, 
uh, pronation neutral supination. Um, so I, I love these images. These are from Tom Graham, um, and they're published in the hand clinics in uh, 2011. Um, and if you look at, at the, that inset B at the bottom, uh, there's this uh, fiber cartilage, which is sort of meniscoid. And it, it, it's almost like a, like a glenoid labrum. It's a lip uh, of tissue um, anchored to the bone uh, from which that subsheath uh, uh, rides up. And it's like a bumper that keeps the ECU tendon from uh, he heading too uh, volarly. Uh, and so you can see the thickening on the volar ulnar side as compared with the dorsal side, which is like more of a traditional attachment. Um, and so the ECU can escape like, like you see on the left where the retinaculum, the subsheath is uh, disrupted, uh, it's torn uh, and um, uh, it pops out uh, or it can be attenuated like what you see here and it's sort of pulled off like a bank heart uh, and allows the ECU to translate beyond the lip. Um, and so if you go back here, if like if you look and you didn't have a subsheath, if all you had was a retinaculum, you could see how the ECU could, could slide all the way around the ulna. Uh, it wouldn't be restrained within the groove. So that the subsheath is, uh, is important to, to limit the translation that's occurring. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the ECU subsheath is a component of the triangular fibrocartilage complex. Um, and so when patients have ECU instability, it's important to think about uh, the peripheral triangular fibrocartilage because if they have a, a destabilizing tear in pronation, the ulna will go dorsal uh, and the ECU will stay volar with the, with the hand because the ECU is attached to the to base of the fifth, right? So you can have ECU, ECU subluxation uh, that's not really uh, related to um, a subsheath tear if you have a peripheral TFC tear, or you could have both. Um, and this is a patient, uh, he had had surgery uh, previously for uh, ECU instability and it didn't work. Um, and I think it was just, it was one of those things that it was, it was missed because um, the surgeon thought that the instability was on one side when it was actually on the other side. Um, but important to have the patient demonstrate it. So you can see here, uh, the ECU is uh, dorsal. And then as he's supinating, which is a, a little counterintuitive to me, um, and he sort of rotates his hand, it pops over the volar lip. Um, and here are uh, his uh, images. You can see something's not quite right on the, on the uh, coronal image on the left. You could see that pocket, uh, which is a little bigger, the, uh, that's wrapping around the, uh, the ulna uh, here. Uh, and here are some uh, axial images, and you can see some signal change within the, uh, within the ECU. Um, but interestingly, so uh, it says, and this was not Rob again. This is, Rob, you didn't do this. It says, I'll read it to you, the ECU uh, sheath demonstrates minimal thickening without significant tendon sheath fluid as it approaches the broad shallow ulnar groove. The tendon remains centered in the groove without displacement or subluxation. Uh, there's a tiny short segment of signal change within the tendon without further evidence of a tendon tear. And there's some edema. So he here are some screenshots of the ECU. Um, and I think that that radiologist had better vision than me because I don't really even see a, a sheath there, but um, the tendon is like, is way away from the bone. It normally doesn't sit that far away from the bone um, as you see there. Uh, and here is uh, intraoperative. So the hand is to the ceiling um, and we're looking at the ulnar aspect of the wrist. You can see in supination, bang, it pops over the volar lip. There it is. Interesting, huh? So in uh, pronation, it was back up where uh, it belonged and supination, it, it fell out. And uh, the surgeon had put some stitches in the dorsal side, but it wasn't subluxating dorsally, it was actually subluxating volar lip. Um, and so here is uh, intraoperative. So the hand is to the, to the right. And so what we do is we 
take it off the dorsal side to access it. And uh, you can see the retinaculum and the subsheath rotated out together. And the groove is shallow. Uh, and so we do uh, what's called a uh, groove deepening. And so uh, we take a burr uh, and then do something like that. Maybe that's a little bit exaggerated, but the point is uh, to have some, uh, uh, some bony uh, stability, add some bony stability to the uh, sixth compartment. Uh, and then we put some anchors or you can just drill some holes and put stitches in uh, the volar lip like that. Uh, and then secure the, uh, the retinaculum to, it's like doing a bank cut repair essentially. So you're securing it to the, to the lip itself, not around the side uh, to restrict the tendon from popping over like that. And that's what it looks like uh, when we're done. Um, so in, in summary, uh, dynamic troubles like the elbow plica, posterior lateral instability, TFCC tears and ECU instability may not be caught adequately in the snapshot of an MRI. Uh, communication between a surgeon and radiologist is essential and I am uh, grateful to Rob uh, and all that he's done for me and for our patients over the years. Um, uh, we've had a great relationship uh, and uh, you know he asks the questions and uh, I think it's really helpful in terms of being able to, uh, uh, to synthesize the, uh, you know, the clinical findings with uh, the radiographic findings. Uh, and when in doubt, order a physical exam. Um, order a physical exam before an MRI. Uh, trust your patient's stories. When the patients say that these snapping things are happening, uh, they, they mean it. <laughs> and you just got to figure it out. It's like a little detective uh, story. Uh, and maybe consider a dynamic study for some of these, like, uh, like ultrasound. And Rob and I have... Uh, have, have done that over the years for some of these more challenging uh, uh, cases. So that's it. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Cassidy. And um, <clears throat> gonna have to hire an attorney, I think, after this talk. Um, uh, we'll do a, a, a short um, uh, question and answer session if, if anybody wants to uh, uh, pose a question or, or uh, comment on uh, what Dr. Cassidy has discussed. I have a question, Dr. Cassidy. Sure. Uh, you commented just uh, by gestalt that in one of the axial uh, wrist images, you thought the distal ulna was a bit sublux dorsally. And, uh, you know, I, I constantly struggle. People on our forum know that I have a constant problem struggling with the variable wrist position for MRI. And often it, it depends on the patient's comfort or the particular surface coil that you have in a particular magnet or the tech who's positioning the patient. And so it's all over the place. But it was my understanding that when the wrist is positioned in pronation, that the distal ulna normally translates dorsally. So I never know what's pathologic or not. Yeah, I, I agree. And I had, I guess I had the benefit of, of a physical examination and knowing, but I agree in that one image, um, it, it does, it does translate. And so I, I would say kind of in the mid range, it should, those arcs should be fairly parallel, you know, as you get more to the extreme of rotation, they won't be parallel any longer, uh, but you're absolutely right. And, uh, there's a fair degree of, uh, variability, um, in it and uh, and they're not all taken the same way. I, I agree with you. Uh, so I look at where the groove is, and you could, you know, look at where the styloids are as you scroll through it to see what position uh, the forearm was in. Also, uh, another question: where we're imaging, I feel a bit at a loss without being able to examine the patient. Just you started with that uh, with the synovial plica in the elbow. And I mean, certainly people have normal, normal elbow plica, and I, I don't know what the threshold is for accusing it of being pathologic. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that that's um, that's where I think the onus is on the surgeon um, to give you as much information as possible, as opposed to just ordering a study. Um, and 
what can you see? Uh, so she had that woman uh, who had the the uh, cartilage loss in the radial ulnar joint and uh, or the radial margin of the radial head and the uh, capitellum they actually had a little edema in the in the capitellum, um, which was a clue. Um, but yeah, you're you're right. So the little triangle is is a normal structure. Uh, that's that's for sure. But uh, it's varying. And I looked at a few papers that measured how you know how far they came into the radio capitellar joint to to try to uh, describe what would be potentially symptomatic. And I'm not sure I buy it. But mm -hmm. yeah, and again, it's it, you know it would be interesting to do this in, in different degrees of elbow uh, flexion because that that structure will look very differently uh, depending on what, you know, where the elbow is when it's taken. So then I'm jumping between the elbow and the wrist, but um, another question. So I saw in that case um, where you had a, a type, uh, um, um, a TFC state uh, tear that was uh, isolated to the uh, um, foveal, uh, foveal insertion. Yeah. Uh, of the ulnar limb. Um, I think that was an arthrogram where, uh, where you had the radio, uh, radiocarpal joint injected. Yeah. So, so the unstable ones, I mean, the common denominator is the disruption of, of the foveal fibers of the, of the foveal lamina of the ulnar limb. And so if that's torn in isolation, or if both the foveal and styloid lamina are torn, they, those are both unstable. So why is it that we inject the radiocarpal compartment? Why don't we just inject the the um, uh, distal radial ulnar joint? Yeah, like the old days, huh? Yeah. Well, except I, except I'm not suggesting three compartments to shoot myself. But I mean, yeah, I, I, you I, would capture one or the other. You're you're looking for the unstable one, right? Right. I. I totally agree with you. So an undersurface tear, it'd be like if you took a scalpel and just parallel to the distal edge of the owner head and you just slid it across right. and cut that off, their distal radial joint is going to be unstable, but their arthrogram is not going to show any flow into their distal radial joint. That's what makes it so challenging. Those uh, And mm -hmm. it, you, know, you only end up catching it on a couple of cuts, right? Maybe, maybe one. Of, yeah, maybe one. It depends. Yes, you're right. Um, and so uh, that, yeah, that is tough. And so you're just looking at some signal change in the in that area, really, unless it's totally off. Like a couple of those, I showed the coronal images where you could see it was retracted. It was it was really torn off. But more often than not, it it, it doesn't look like that. It's just some subtle signal change on the underside, which uh, is not to me. It's not very helpful. I don't know about. Do you think a, an ultrasound is a value for that? No, I don't think so either. So no, I it's fantastic for the ECU instability. And then, I, I mean, I'm being an askaholic here. If anybody else has a question, just turn your mic on and uh, barge in. But um, I actually had a, a, an, an ultrasound technologist who had, um, who had chronic uh, ECU snapping. And um, she, for many years, she said it was like a party trick and it was painless and she just would do it. But then she became an ultrasound technologist. And I think just like work related, it, it was just um, so frequent and um, it became symptomatic. And, and so she, she had a surgical repair, but you know, we're told that, well, sometimes these snapping tendons are just asymptomatic and incidental, but but in a sense, I mean, the people who become symptomatic, they must have been asymptomatic and incident, incidental for some time, right? I mean, it's just a matter of how long they've been, uh, you know, yeah. having that friction syndrome. Well, yeah, I think you're right. You can also get Never it as an acute traumatic single event, but oh. yeah, but um, I, yeah, I think you're right about that. Um, what was I going to say? Oh. So that was what I de what I demonstrated was I, I would call it an anatomic reconstruction. Uh, oftentimes, surgeons will do uh, an extra anatomic reconstruction where they take some of the extensor retinaculum across the dorsum of the wrist, and then uh, so leave it uh, 
only based on like the fifth compartment and then flip it over and then loop around the ECU tendon and sew it back to itself. And so it's like a sling that's holding it in space. Um, so not against the ulna, but it's, uh, so it's out, out in space, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, but that, that is an operation that some people do. Uh, some people also, just thinking about things, uh, some people also use anchors for uh, TFC repairs. So the, into the fovea, which um, I don't like, personally, I don't like having uh, the suture knots in the joint if I can avoid it. So I like the way that I demonstrated in that uh, this, the knots are outside the joint and in an area that's fairly inconspicuous. Uh, and also you're pulling the ligament down to the bone as you're tightening it, as opposed to when you use a, an anchor, you're really kind of like trying to push with your knot the, the tissue down. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Any other questions? Oh, somebody's Hello. got a hand up. Yeah, I, it's Rob Lambert. I've got my hand up. Uh, just to say about the, you know, the sort of triangle harbor cartilage and uh, you, you know, the related ligaments, I, I find it a particularly challenging area because of the triangular configuration of these tissues and add plus the variability of the degree of pronation, supination, so that it, it is so difficult to get um, orthogonal images that are orthogonal to all components of this complex. So you, you're always cutting across part or all of these ligaments at an angle. And uh, yeah, or it's, uh, a lot of the time it's pristine normal and that's easy, but um, a lot of the time there are minor changes and it's just, it's tough to interpret on MR, uh, I find, because uh, of, uh, of its triangular shape. You know, yeah. and, and menisci in the knee and there's a whole bunch of other more complex shaped structures in the body that I find easy to interpret. But the TFCC and its adjacent ligaments, I find one of the most difficult areas to interpret of everything I look at. Well, I think if we could have some standard positioning, neutral positioning, it would be less of a challenge. I like that. That makes a lot of sense to me. If you could I mean, be... I, I, I know that I see a lot of wrists positioned in ulnar deviation. And if you're trying to interpret if you're trying to find a TFC t tear with the wrist and ulnar deviation, it becomes, you know, very crowded. It in does, there. Yeah. 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 Is anybody um, using uh, volumetric spin echo acquisitions for um, arthrograms for rule out TFCC tear? You know, it, it might give us the opportunity to. Um, you know, reformat multiple different planes afterward, as well as getting, you know, small, you know, very thin slices. I assume shouldn't... somebody is. I just reviewed um, something on the ankle where they were doing that for, you know, similarly small structures. I, I do it for the hip because, um, you know, it gives us the ability to, you know, go circle around looking for cam deformities, but maybe okay. it's something I should be applying to the wrist. Um, you know, to, to get just a tighter look at everything and, and not use a, um, a gradient. I don't know if people are even using gradients anymore. Well, we, we, do, we do because I have a colleague who uh, can't let go of it and I don't see what it does for us. So. Uh, the other oh. question I have is whether if, if the specific clinical question relates to query of CC tear and uh, the related ligaments, and we're going to do an arthrogram, should we preferentially do the distal ready ulnar joint arthrogram? That's what I said, Rob. I, I know, I know, <laughs> but I wanted to hear what some other people thought about that. Should we, should we stop doing radiocarpal for that indication? And as Hillary suggested, only do the distal ready ulnar joint injection. I, think I mean, the, the radiocarpal makes sense for the scaphalunate ligament. I mean, but shouldn't it be tailored for what it is you're looking for? Yeah. I, I agree, but my last comment here is that I would say 90% of our intercarpal ligament MR, we do without an arthrogram, we're happy without it. But when it's TFCC, often an arthrogram is requested, but we're doing injecting the wrong space. It seems that it's the wrong side to me. Well, it, yeah. I think it depends on what you're, what you're looking for. So for example, 
uh, with ulnar impaction syndrome, uh, you may have a, an LT tear, right? So I suppose if, you know, if it flows through your TFC and, and then makes its way into your mid-carpal joint, that's okay, but right? So for ulnar impaction syndrome, they get, uh, they get degenerative TFC tears and they get lunar, attritional lunotriquetral tears. So that's where that, that would make sense to inject the radiocarpal joint. Uh, because, uh, right, MR is, alone is not great for LT tears. Um, so uh, I, I could see that. But if it were an undersurface tear specifically that someone was looking for, uh, a distal radial joint arthrogram makes more sense to me. Yes. Mm -hmm. How about uh, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament? Do you feel like you can define that well? Uh, yeah. Wait, is that a challenge? Uh, well, it is with, the, so for example, with uh, tennis elbow, if patients have longstanding lateral epicondylitis, there's a lot of you know, change that uh, you'll see uh, on the humeral side and that uh, it may not be easy to define the lateral ligament in that instance, right? And they can have actually, uh, there was a, a case series of uh, iatrogenic lateral elbow instability from multiple steroid injections for tennis elbow. Well, that's not, a, that's not surprising. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Oh, uh, by the way, uh, Rob, uh, surgeons miss undersurface TFC tears when they do rest arthroscopy sometimes, <laughs> you know, because you can't, it's not like a central tear. You're not looking at a, a hole or a flap. You have to really have a high degree of suspicion and, you know, take your time and probe that area at the pre recess and see. Uh, but I've taken care of a number of patients who've had scopes and it was just missed. Okay. It sounds like we're going to be injecting the DRUJ. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Rob. But um, isn't, how good is the ballotment test or is that tramp? No, not ballotment, trampoline. Test. The trampoline, yeah, you got it. It is highly subjective. Oh, so it's not, <laughs> it's not going to alert you to that hidden undersurface tear. I don't think it's so. I, th I, I like so to. For, so, so explain what I'm asking about. Everyone might not know. Oh, the, oh sorry. Yeah. So the, uh, the triangular fibrocartilage, it's, it, when it's taut, when it's attached uh, firmly, it has a certain degree of uh, ballotment. Like you said, uh, we call it a trampoline test if you take a probe. Um, and if you, uh, if it's torn, it's retracted. It's sort of like, uh, I don't want to say bulbous, I guess I do, uh, but it will be, it, it, it'll be lax and you'll feel that you don't feel the tautness in it. And then when you reattach it, like what I showed, when you pull it back down, then you reestablish the tension on it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it is highly subjective. I like to, to put the probe in the pre recess and see if I can hook underneath and, and pull it up which is what uh, was demonstrated there. I think that's probably the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I have scoped the distal radial ulnar joint before. You need a 1.9 millimeter scope and you actually can't do anything. You can't do anything. You can you see, can see. It, you, can but you can't see. do anything. Yeah. That's crazy. Very tight space. <laughs> and if it's not tight, you don't need to be putting a scope in there because you know what's wrong. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Well, Dr. Cassidy, I, I think that about wraps things up, unless somebody has a one last question. Uh, oh. Thank you so much for your, your time. And, um, and again, thanks a lot, Dr. Cassidy. All right, thanks, no, Dr. Thanks, Cassidy. Thanks for the invitation. Love,